Well, good morning, and thanks for joining us again. Uh, I've been wondering, what have you gained from the studies so far? Uh, what are the issues or questions that they have raised for you? You might like to take a note of that. So thanks for joining us, and I hope today's session will help. In a previous, a previous session, we talked about personal transformation and how the Holy Spirit, through the process of sanctification, is moulding and shaping us to be more like Jesus, to be more Christ-like, reflecting the character and nature of Jesus. And as we read the New Testament, we realised this isn't just about a private or personal transformation. The Spirit of God also begins to transform our community and our society. Uh, and as an example of this, and there are others in the scriptures, we find uh, Acts 4 from verses 23 to 37, uh, particularly from verse 32, and I'll read that. And all the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed anything of their own, uh, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. There were, also, there were, there were no needy persons among them. From time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, and brought the money for the, from the sales and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Now, it says that uh, Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, sold a field he owned and brought the money and put it at the disciples' feet, the apostles' feet amazing picture of the early Christian community. The Christian faith made a profound difference to the community. However, after 2000 years, um, we know that changing society isn't that easy. It's, it's complex and a difficult thing. Some would say it's impossible. Others might say, what's the point? If God is going to destroy it all, and one day when Jesus comes, create a new world and a new heaven and a new earth, why just leave it to God to do? But as we, <coughs> as we read the New Testament, it's clear that only God can tr fully transform our world and our society. And the book of Revelation tells us that God will bring a renewed earth, making all things new. So this, however, raises the question, should Christians and the church try to address the problems our society faces? And our society faces a lot of problems. and Many people suffer. There's a lot of injustice in our world. There's poverty and hunger problems of crime and violence in our community, the disturbing problem of drug addiction, which leads to the increase of the crime rate. For example, many home invasions and robberies and acts of violence are drug-related. So how can Christians work toward the transformation of our community? It is a fact of history that Christianity has profoundly and positively affected the world over the last 2,000 years, and there are many examples of this. Uh, in the uh, early centuries, <coughs> excuse me, convents and monasteries uh, and the, the nuns and the monks that worked well, lived within them provided medical care for the poor. Um, the people who couldn't afford doctors. Um, they gave assistance to the poor 
uh, they gave protection and a uh, uh, respite for travellers. Uh, and that's actually the origin of St. John of God hospitals. Uh, as the, it was actually, they weren't private hospitals then. They were the, they were the public hospitals for the, the poor. And then, of course, William Wilberforce, with many other Christians, worked for the abolition of slavery. And in America, uh, in the last sort of a couple of hundred years ago, it was many Christians and church groups that were working for the abolition of slavery. In recent times, people like Charles Colson established Prison Fellowship International, and he worked not only to uh, increase change the lives of individual prisoners by bringing them to Christ, but lobbied for the better prison conditions, especially in South American prisons where the conditions were quite horrific. And a factor of this is as many of the Christians became, uh, many of the prisoners became Christians, they got involved in improving their own conditions. So they would start to take pride in their own environment. They'd keep the place clean. They wouldn't destroy things. They looked after each other. So there was an internal transformation as well as people looking to improve the rights and uh, sort of for institutional conditions of the prisons. And then we have this, the story of Jackie Pullinger, who you might have read the book, um, where she worked in the really desperate places of Hong Kong, working with uh, drug addicts and uh, the street gangs, to such a degree that when they became transformed, likewise, they started to work on improving the conditions of the, of the communities in which they lived. So the transformation of individuals led to the transformation of the community. Another example is in Portland, Oregon, where a gospel mission group started life change. It's a job training uh, skills program for convicted felons and drug addicts. Now, along with the practical training for uh, work skills, um, giving secular skills, they also uh, included in their program uh, basic Christian training, instilling sk the skills and habits of integrity and reliability, uh, responsibility, honesty, um, and it helped them to become effective and successful um, employees. And many of them um, significantly improved their lives. And of course, there are many other examples of how Christians have made a positive difference in the world. I want to suggest some factors that have made a difference. Now, you might think of others. Um, just for the sake of brevity, I've just focused on a few. First one is the concept of radical Christianity or radical discipleship. What is radical Christianity? What would a radical Christian look, look like? They don't go around shooting people or stabbing strangers. <clears throat> um, is it about demonstrating outside abortion clinics or protesting outside Parliament House? might be in some cases. Uh, but when you think of some of the great teachings and commands of Jesus and some of the teachings of the apostles in the New Testament, what would ch church be like if we took them literally and seriously? For example, love your enemies. Love your neighbor as yourself. Forgive as God has forgiven you. Speak the truth in love. 
and 1 Corinthians 13 when Paul says uh, describes love he says love is patient and kind does not love does not on, insist on its own way love uh, endures all things what would it be like if we really took that seriously the scriptures and the apostles and Jesus talked about feeding the poor or helping the poor, feeding the hungry, healing the sick, defending the fatherless and the widows. Uh, we talked last time about the fruit of the Spirit being love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness and self-control. How would Christians manifesting the fruit of the Spirit affect the community? Imagine all Christian workers, salesmen, politicians, being honest and always truthful. That would be interesting to see. The other principle I want to talk to look at, the other thing is praying for the community. And we might say, oh yeah, we do that. But there are many books about praying for the community some specifically about organizing combined churches and there are groups uh, particularly in america but in australia as well where they have 24 7 prayer houses praying for the community and they report that when they do this there's significant changes in the community through their prayer The results sometimes are, are quite significant the, um, where there's an increase in the arrests of drug traffickers and dealers as well as m drug addicts becoming Christians and uh, committed felons and criminals realising what they're doing is wrong, ex-prisoners becoming uh, transformed and having their lives changed. And then there's the, one of the other things is inf influencing and changing our culture. And this is primarily through getting involved in the community. Here's a question. Should Christians get involved in politics? We talk about the separation of church and state. Uh, should a Christian join a political party? Well, the fact is they do. Uh, and this is a contentious issue for many churches, that there are many politicians in various political parties, and they actually make a huge difference. Um, the, the problem is we see uh, some major conflicts and division uh, this creates in the United States. Um, and we have this polarization of Christians who are Republicans, the conservative Christians against uh, the leftist uh, Democrats. And I don't think it's that simple because there are Christians on both sides. <clears throat> See, the issue is, uh, the, it raises the question, are we viewing Christianity from a political perspective or viewing politics from a biblical Christian perspective. So what's our dominant worldview? An example of that, or what I mean by that is, sometimes you see key leaders, and I won't name anybody, but you can think of it yourself, people who use Christians. They try to play a Christian game, use Christian terminology, to get the church on their side. Their primary goal is to promote their policies and interests by using Christianity instead of using politics to help promote the good of society through Christian principles. A Christian worldview acknowledges that every human person, especially leaders and people of power, are ultimately accountable to God as our creator. 
So another thing to, to be aware of in our involvement in the community is the parables of salt and yeast. <coughs> Jesus shared these parables about uh, the influence of the kingdom of God on the wider society. The point of the parables was that it's not the size or the power or the uh, the uh, the obvious size of the the item, but it's its potency, its influence. Some uh, uh, the text about this is Jesus said, "You are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness." How can it be made salty again? It's no good for anything. So we have to, the salt, the purity of it, our char character and quality of life influence the society in which we're placed. Colossians 4, it says, Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversations always be full of grace seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone Matthew 17 uh, is when Jesus talks about the mustard seed being really small seed but it grows into a very large bush and saying even if we have faith the size of a mustard seed it will it can have significant um, and impressive results so the point of these mini parables is it's not about size or volume. It's not about power to change, but our ability to influence. There's a Christian organisation in Perth that works to divert women from choosing abortion. They do this by giving help and support to pregnant women. <clears throat> and for decades, Pregnancy Problem House has provided this service and there are hundreds of cases of young women who've been helped, who've been counselled to not follow the path of abortion, but to choose to have their babies. And they still have choices whether to keep it, put it up for adoption. Um, so there's still other choices there. But they provide personal support, encouragement and counselling, as well as practical help providing the resources, the materials they need uh, to care for a child. And they do this during their pregnancy and after the, they've had given birth. So it's a long-term support. So the examples of yeast and salt show us that direct involvement in the lives of others in our community can and do make a difference. The overriding question today I'm raising is how can Christians work towards the transformation of our cult, of us community? It's a big question which takes more than just this short session to deal with. And it's about affecting the culture in which we live. I want you to think about how what is culture and how do we affect it? How do we change culture? It's about the way people think and behave and, and act. It's also about language. You notice that over the decades, the way people have changed culture, our culture, is to change language, terminology. Think about that. Well, thanks for listening. I hope this has been helpful. You may like to get together with a couple of other people or as a group and discuss the following questions. You may have some other questions that are raised from this session. So, how can Christians work to work toward the transformation of our of our community? Question one. Um, I want you to think about what's the vision, current vision of your church. How do you need to revisit the vision of your church to be more effective in the community? Question two, what is radical Christianity? What would a radical disciple 
look like. When you think of some of the great teachings and commands of Jesus, what would the church be like if we took them literally and seriously? Question three, should, a, should Christians get involved with politics? Should you join a political party? Maybe some of you have. So why or oh, why not? Um, <clears throat> Are we viewing Christianity from a political perspective or viewing politics from a biblical Christian perspective? What do you think the difference is? And fourth question, if you get around to it, uh, what Christian politicians are you aware of? Are we praying for these politicians? Uh, what's a way we can encourage those Christians in Parliament, the people that represent us are Christian, how can we encourage and support them? Well, thanks for listening, and, God, and may God bless and keep you uh, until we meet again. Take care.